Thanks so much. Okay, so hi again, everyone. My name is Marcus Salvatore, and I'm an anesthesiologist and CVICU attending at Toronto General with an interest in perioperative echocardiography. And I'm here to talk to you today about TEE and surgical decision making in the operating room. I want to thank you all for attending today, and also want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present. It's an honor to close out this inaugural year of this province-wide initiative, and I'm eager to see how it will continue to grow and evolve in the upcoming years. I again have to acknowledge the efforts and dedication of both Raphael and Fabio, who really deserve an incredible amount of recognition for bringing us together and organizing these multi-center echo rounds. The feedback we've received uh, so far has been very encouraging, and we would like to continue to expand. So please email Raphael or Fabio with any suggestions regarding format or potential topics, or if you know of any other centers that would like to be included. Uh, we are in the process of getting these rounds accredited, so hopefully we will be eligible for CPD credits in the upcoming year. So I have no disclosures or competing interests, but in terms of acknowledgements, I've had the good fortune to train under some incredibly supportive and experienced mentors that are world renowned for their expertise in echocardiography. Particular thanks goes to Dr. Ahmad Omran, consultant cardiologist who helped to develop this lecture and joins us on the call today to provide additional insights. I also wanna acknowledge the talented roster of cardiovascular surgeons that we have here at TGH. Collaboration and collegiality across the drapes is essential for optimal patient outcomes in all ORs, but nowhere is it more important than complex cardiac surgery. To that end, I would like to introduce Dr. Mitesh Padiwala, a cardiovascular surgeon here at TGH who specializes in advanced valve repair, mechanical circulatory support, and heart transplantation. He's joined the call today to provide a valuable surgical perspective. So today's lecture is inspired by the 2020 ASC guidelines entitled the use of transesophageal echocardiography to assist with surgical decision-making in the operating room, a surgery-based approach by Alina Naikawara and a roster of international experts that includes our very own Dr. Vegas. Prior to the publication of these guidelines, there was little instruction on how to best apply existing ASC guidelines to the perioperative setting. Most ASC guidelines were developed for cardiologists interpreting transthoracic images under ideal conditions. But as we all know, the OR is a very different place, a dynamic environment with unique challenges. As highlighted by Nakuara, hemodynamic fluctuations, electrical pacing, positive pressure ventilation, fluid shifts, and surgical maneuvers can all impact echocardiographic evaluation. It is still vitally important that we are able to perform rapid, thorough, and accurate assessments so that we can best inform surgical decision-making. Over the course in the course of this lecture, we will review three cases in which TEE was essential to surgical decision-making. We will show how TEE can be used to refine diagnoses, detect new pathology, adjust the surgical plan, and assess surgical results. We have included evidence-based discussion from the surgical literature where appropriate. You will be polled several times throughout the lecture on what you would decide in a given situation. So quickly, before we get started, some important caveats to mention. Firstly, the optimal surgical technique or approach will depend largely on local expertise and experience. Optimal is in quotation marks here, as there are often many ways to skin a cat, and the technique most likely to succeed is the one most familiar to the surgeon. Secondly, the 2020 guidelines are comprehensive, but obviously can't cover every surgical circumstance or ambiguity that may arise. In those cases, we have deferred to the surgical and echocardiographic literature to guide our decision making. Lastly, although the specific surgeries that we are going to discuss may not be performed at your institution, the learning points are all broadly applicable. So without further ado, let's get right into the first case. So our first case involves a 19-year-old woman with severe symptomatic mitral regurgitation in the context of Lewis Dietz syndrome. Lewis Dietz, or LDS, is a genetic connective tissue disease similar to Marfan's. Compared to patients with Marfan syndrome, LDS is characterized by a more aggressive vascular course. Morbidity and mortality occur at an earlier age, with dissections occurring at smaller aortic dimensions. Although the management of patients with connective tissue disease is mainly focused on prevention of aortic dissection, mitral valve involvement occurs in 60 to 75% of cases and is a considerable source of morbidity. Common mitral valve abnormalities include mitral valve prolapse and myxomatous degeneration with severe MR. 
Our patient had undergone routine surveillance since early childhood when a floppy mitral valve was first diagnosed. Over the last three years, she had become increasingly symptomatic, describing NYHA class three symptoms and showing new LV dilatation on echocardiogram. Intraoperative TEE confirmed severe mitral regurgitation resulting from myxomatous degeneration of the valve. The LV was severely dilated with an LV internal end diastolic diameter of 64 millimeters. Despite the degree of dilatation, biventricular function was preserved. The left atrium is enlarged and the intraatrial septum bows to the right, consistent with severely elevated left atrial pressures from the MR. Turning our attention to the mitral valve, we clearly see myxomatous disease. Now we often think of myxomatous disease as a single entity, but it actually exists as a continuum from Barlow's disease on one end to fibroelastic deficiency on the other, as described by the STCS paper by Adams in 2007. This is more than an academic distinction. Where the valve exists on this continuum determines its repairability. The degeneration seen in connective tissue disease is surgically and pathologically similar to Barlow's disease. Like Barlow's, these valves show myxoid infiltration with excess tissue. As a result, the leaflets are bulky and billowing, often with multi-segmental prolapse, as shown here. Examination of the valve also revealed mitral annular disjunction, or an abnormal atrial displacement of the mitral valve leaflet hinge point, visible here. The presence of mitral annular disjunction has prognostic value in patients with connective tissue disease, as Chivalescu in 2021 published a paper in EHJ that shows that the presence of MAD predicted aortic events at a younger age and the likelihood of needing mitral valve surgery. Panning through the valve, we see severe MR originating from two jets, one centrally directed and one anteriorly directed. 3D imaging shows prolapse of all anterior and posterior leaflet segments. Evaluation of the aorta was vitally important in this case, as we know that many of these patients will go on to require aortic repair or replacement early in life. The aortic valve was competent with an aortic situs, di situs diameter of 40 millimeters and an ascending aorta diameter of 22 millimeters. Interestingly, what was not detected on the pre-op echo was a dilated myxomatous tricuspid valve. The diameter of the tricuspid valve is 46 millimeters. Here we can see the same redundant and voluminous leaflet tissue with multi-segment prolapse that characterized the mitral valve. This was an interesting finding as primary tricuspid disease is relatively rare with 75% of TR being functional in nature. Here the TR was graded as moderate with at least two jets visualized. Closer inspection of the valve also shows tricuspid annular disjunction. This is a newly described entity that has gained traction in the literature over the past year. We can clearly see that the junction of the atrial wall and tricuspid valve leaflet occurs well above the upper limit of the ventricular myocardium. The clinical implications of this finding are still being explored, but a small single center study by Abel in 2021 does not seem to implicate tricuspid annular disjunction in the development of ventricular arrhythmias. So this brings us to our first poll. Thank you to Raphael for helping to set up the polling system and interactivity. So given the echo findings, the patient age and history of connective tissue disease, which interventions would you recommend? Please select as many options as you think apply. Listed here are the most pertinent features of the mitral valve to help with your decision-making. We will give you the next 30 seconds to lock in your decision. Thirty seconds, Marcus. Yeah. So as the results are tallied, let's review the recommendations from the guidelines. 
In their section on mitral regurgitation, Naikawara identified the following features predictive of SAM following mitral valve repair. A myxomatous mitral valve with redundant leaflet tissue, a non-dilated LV, anterior and posterior leaflet lengths of over 20 and 15 millimeters respectively, measured in mid-diastole. Ratio between the lengths of the interior and posterior leaflets of less than 1.3 in systole, a short C-set distance of under 25 millimeters, a narrow aortomitral angle of less than 120 degrees, a thick basal intraventricular septum of over 15 millimeters, and anterior displacement of the papillary muscles. Although intuitively, you would think that the more predictors present, the greater the likelihood of SAM, this assumption has never been proven. Our patient has three predictors of SAM following repair. Before revealing the poll results, I'd like to take a moment to hear from Dr. Bariwala. So Mitesh, regardless of what the literature says, in reality, do these echocardiographic features influence your management? And how do they weigh compared to direct visual inspection of the valve? So they do uh, weigh into our, our management. In other words, if you find these, these um, echo findings, then it makes us alert to the fact that the patient is at high risk of SAM, and it will um, uh, change our surgical approach um, to take that into account. In other words, we will conduct maneuvers to try and minimize the risk of SAM um, to compensate for some of these echocardiographic findings. Uh, we, will, we will make the posterior leaf clip shorter if we need to. We will make sure the coaptation line is posterior. We will avoid the use of downsizing rings. Um, and so, or we'll do a myectomy if, if that's the case. So it, it does influence our management. Um, uh, in terms of visual inspection of the valve, visual inspection of the valve um, will only give us the heights of the posterior and anterior leaflets. Um, it gives us limited data to um, uh, suspect the, there would be a higher risk of SAM other than the tall posterior leaflet. Classically, more than 15 millimeters on visual inspection should, should alert us to the fact that there is a higher risk of SAM or a coaptation margin that is more mid or, or anteriorly located. Uh, and so the echo findings do, do influence our management. This is very helpful. And with myxomatous disease in particular, what are the features that make a repair most challenging? Um, so, you know, if it's isolated to posterior leaflet in one segment, it's easy. If it's isolated to posterior segment, multi, uh, posterior leaflet multi-segment, it's a little bit more challenging, but still relatively simple. But when it affects both leaflets and there is a relative difference in the coaptation height, in other words, one leaflet is prolapsing at a uh, to a different severity than the other, then that makes the repair more challenging. Um, and if there is uh, features that would increase the risk of SAM, that also uh, makes the, the repair more complex. Um, but if it's myxomatous disease, surgeons typically um, have an easier overall time fixing a valve because there's more leaflet material to play with, potentially to resect, as opposed to fibroelastic deficiency where you know, you're limited to, to resuspension techniques alone and there's very little leaflet tissue to play with or, or to remove. And if you try to, you'll, you'll uh, make the valve too small. Perfect, thanks, that's great. So Rafael, if you could put up the poll results. So we see that people recommend mitral valve repair, looks like 60% and TV repair. Some have recommended mitral valve replacement given the features that we've seen. Nobody recommends to replace the tricuspid valve and nobody um, says that we should replace or touch the ascending aorta, okay? So let's see how that compares to uh, real life. So the mitral valve was repaired in this case. On surgical inspection, the mitral valve was a Barlow's valve with myxomatous degeneration of all segments. The surgeon repaired the valve using a looping technique to place eight neocords to the P1 and P2 segments, as well as a 75 millimeter simplicity annuloplasty band. A tricuspid annuloplasty was also performed to correct the TR and gross dilatation of the tricuspid valve annulus. There was no ascending aorta intervention. A small PFO was closed and the left atrial appendage was ligated. Now the closure of the appendage is a bit controversial in this patient, but it is the common practice of the primary surgeon. 
the only guidelines on surgical closure of the left atrial appendage during concomitant cardiac surgery are the 2017 STS and 2016 ESC guidelines for the management of atrial fibrillation. Both of these doc documents state that only closure of the, sorry, only state that closure of the LAA is considered reasonable as a class 2A or B recommendation. There is no recommendation regarding prophylactic closure of the left atrial appendage for patients in sinus rhythm, but this degree of biatrial dilatation at such a young age would definitely predispose the patient to arrhythmias later in life. Unfortunately, echocardiographic evaluation of the repair revealed moderate to severe posteriorly directed MR and severe systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. Now, the obvious question to ask is whether this persistent MR is caused entirely by dynamic SAM or whether there is any underlying structural MR from an incomplete or inadequate valve repair. As you recall, there were two jets of mitral regurgitation seen in the baseline study one centrally directed and one anteriorly directed. There is only one jet visible now and it is posteriorly directed, which is consistent with MR from SAM. Furthermore, if we slowly scroll through this clip, we can see that the MR does not appear until after the T wave in late systole, which is also a feature of SAM related MR. So let's see if I can just slow this down here. Okay, so going frame by frame and looking at the ECG at the bottom, we see that the MR starts to appear just after the T wave. So measurements were repeated, which show an anterior leaflet measuring 26 millimeters and an intraventricular septum of 13 millimeters. 3D evaluation of the valve showed that there really weren't any more prolapsing segments. And the length of the posterior annulus to the coaptation point was 17 millimeters. So for our second poll, the surgeon turns to you and asks, what do you think I should do? Now the 2020 guidelines predict SAM before repair, but they don't give much additional guidance on what to do if you have SAM post repair. So the options are, A, attempt medical management with volume expansion, reduction in heart rate, increase peripheral resistance, reduce contractility and discontinuation of any inotropes. Revise repair by shortening the anterior leaflet. Revise repair by shortening the posterior leaflet. Perform a myectomy. Replace the mechanical, with, sorry, replace the valve with a mechanical valve. Replace the valve with a low profile bioprosthetic epic valve or insert a larger annuloplasty ring. Again, choose all options that you feel are correct. We'll give you 30 seconds. That's 30 seconds there, I win the pool, okay. Perfect. So we'll take a look at the results. Also, it's good, a lot of variability in terms of answers here. So attempt medical management, 80% uh, feel that we should do that. Uh, some uh, recommendations for anterior or posterior leaflet lengthening, my, uh, sorry, uh, shortening, a myectomy, replace with a mechanical valve and a larger annual plastic ring. Nobody thinks we should replace it with a tissue valve given the patient's age, good. Okay, so in lieu of ASC recommendations, we defer to the surgical literature for guidance on the management of SAM. There are two papers I would recommend if you're interested in a bit of a deeper dive. The first is a 2012 paper by Ibrahim that talks about the various etiologies of SAM and outlines the strengths and weaknesses of various surgical repair techniques. More useful for us as anesthesiologists and echocardiographers is a 2015 paper by Alfieri that specifically addresses the management of SAM after mitral valve repair. In this paper, Alfieri outlines a comprehensive algorithm for the medical and then surgical management of SAM found in the OR. According to non-published data, Alfieri states that approximately 30% of patients will have resolution of SAM with volume expansion and discontinuation of inotropes. That number increases to 80% with administration of beta blockers and increased afterload using vasopressors or manual occlusion techniques. 
In all patients with transient SAM, medical management is then maintained in the postoperative period to prevent recurrence. The late clinical outcomes of patients who had transient SAM were favorable. Therefore, Alfieri concludes that conservative management of intraoperative transient SAM is considered a reliable policy. The conclusion is supported by a small 2015 study by Cooperstein et al. and JTCS, which showed that post-repair SAM occurs in about 8% of patients, but less than 1% require surgical reintervention. Of those patients with transient medically managed SAM, only 5% showed significant SAM on follow-up stress at echocardiography. In our case, medical management was attempted, but unsuccessful, with the MR persisting despite inotrope discontinuation, volume expansion, esmolol, and SVR augmentation. The decision was made to go back on pump and revise the repair. Now, the nature of the repair to us non-surgeons seems interesting. Like many of you, I would have thought that the most direct method would be to resect or shorten the anterior leaflet, thereby minimizing the amount of excess tissue that is drawn into the LDLT by the Venturi effect. However, the surgeons will almost always choose placement of cordae over leaflet remodeling, as this technique better preserves native valve anatomy. By placing additional neocords in the posterior leaflet, the coaptation point of the mitral valve moves towards the posterior annulus and away from the LVOT. Although we continue to see turbulent flow through the LVOT, the SAM has resolved and there is no residual MR. The diameter of the mitral valve now measured 42 millimeters and continuous wave Doppler interrogation reveals low gradients with no evidence of stenosis. Due to the degree of turbulence, pulse wave Doppler was performed with a sampling envelope in the LVOT, which showed very low gradients and we proceeded with chest closure. Follow-up transthoracic echo performed on postoperative day four showed a global reduction of LV systolic function with an LVEF of 38%. This is a well-recognized sequelae of mitral valve repair, even in patients with normal preoperative LV function. In an observational study from JTCS in 2014, Quintana et al. showed that 18% of patients with normal LV function will develop persistent systolic dysfunction post-repair. Of these patients, only 31% will recover their baseline ejection fraction at five years. Importantly, there was no SAM detected, only trivial MR, and no stenosis of the mitral valve. The tricuspid repair was also performing well. So I think just in the interest of time, we'll go through cases first, and then we can have a question and answer session at the end, uh, just to make sure that we get through all the, the uh, lecture content. So on to the next case. Our second case involves a 50-year-old patient with critical symptomatic stenosis of, the, of a bicuspid aortic valve. This was recently identified after suffering two recent syncopal events within the same month. Preoperative workup showed no significant flow limiting coronary artery disease, but a small RCA. He has no other significant past medical history. The baseline echo shows a bicuspid aortic valve with moderate LV hypertrophy. Long axis view shows a calcified valve with turbulence in the proximal ascending aorta. The annulus of the ascending aorta matched with the preoperative CT with a measured diameter of 29 millimeters. There was no dilatation of the ascending aorta. And the short axis view shows a bicuspid valve with fusion of the right and non-coronary cusps. Transgastric views and Doppler measurements reveal severe AS with a maximum measured velocity of 4.89 meters per second and peak and mean gradients of 96 on 64 millimeters of mercury, respectively. There is mild AI. AVA by continuity equation is 0 0.69. Inflow and outflow, as well as short axis arch views, show a well-functioning pulmonic valve with an annulus of 30 millimeters. And this brings us to our third pole. Given the valve characteristics, a severely calcified bicuspid aortic valve, and the age of the patient at 50 years, what intervention would you recommend? Select all options that you think apply. We'll give you 30 seconds. I think this was supposed to be a single choice. <laughs> 
Oh, sorry, I apologize. Yeah, Raphael, single choice, please. That's 37, I'll win the poll. Okay, take a look at the results. Okay, so mechanical aortic valve in 40%, 24% by prosthetic and a ROS 30%. Okay, good. So after much deliberation, it was decided to proceed with a ROS procedure. A ROS procedure entails replacement of the aortic valve with the patient's own pulmonary valve, followed by the implantation of a cadaveric pulmonic valve homograft. The 2020 ACC AHA guidelines have a grade 2B recommendation for a ROS procedure in patients under 50 years of age who prefer a bioprosthetic AVR and have the appropriate anatomy. Although long-term durability data from experienced centers is excellent, there are additional risks, including the potential long-term failure of two valves, as well as the perils that accompany coronary valve reimplantation, similar to the mental procedure. Coronary implantation can be avoided using the subcoronary technique initially described by Ross, but this is rarely done due to different dimensions and commissural distribution, particularly in patients with aortic insufficiency or a bicuspid or unicuspid aortic valve. Failure after ROS is most attributable to regurgitation of the neoaortic valve in the second decade after the operation. 50% of pulmonary homographs will require reintervention within 10 to 20 years. In order for a patient to be eligible for the ROS procedure, the annular diameters of the pulmonic, pulmonic and aortic valves have to be within two millimeters of each other. With these measurements, sorry, but these measurements are largely derived from the preoperative CTA. As you saw in the preoperative workup, we had good annular match with both diameters being approximately 29 millimeters. Now, when you come off pump and are evaluating the outcome of the ROS procedure, there are no specific guidelines or recommendations for echocardiographic evaluation of the neoaortic valve. In lieu, we use the assessment algorithm proposed by Van Overschelt for aortic valve repair. The likelihood of AI after repair or ROS is low if one, the level of cusp coaptation occurs above the aortic annulus. Two, the effective coaptation height is greater than nine millimeters and reaches the middle of the sinus of Valsalva. And three, the length of cusp apposition is over four millimeters. Although we can't measure the effective height in this image due to poor visibility of the annulus, the coaptation length alone measures eight millimeters, indicating a very low likelihood of regurgitation. Remember that the pulmonary autograft is harvested and implanted as a conduit attached to a short piece of pulmonary artery, and so paravalvular leaks cannot occur. Doppler interrogation of the deep transgastric view shows that the neoaortic valve is free of stenosis or regurgitation with a max velocity under two meters per second and peak and mean gradients of 14 and six millimeters of mercury respectively. The pulmonic valve is replaced with a cadaveric cryopreserved pulmonary homograft. Although it is available in various sizes, the homograft is always oversized to the largest available, or 28 millimeters, due to the risk of pulmonary conduit stenosis, as first reported by Renani and Omran in 2000. A low gradient is crucial here, as peak Doppler gradients will, will typically double within the first week following surgery. After evaluating the valves, we returned to the four-chamber view to see that the RV was increasingly dilated and showing signs of moderate to severe dysfunction. Contractility at the base was preserved, but the remainder was largely akinetic. A short axis mid-papillary view of the left ventricle showed a D-shaped septum in both systole and diastole, suggesting RV pressure and volume overload. And this brings us to our fourth poll. Given this new finding of progressive RV dysfunction, what would you recommend to your surgeon? The options are A, the RV dysfunction is likely due to a long pump run and potentially pacing, so proceed with expectant management only. 
the Doppler and epicardial ultrasound of the RCA and pulmonic valve. C, go back on bypass to examine the RCA button. D, medical management with inotropes and nitric oxide. Or E, go direct to cath lab from the OR. Again, select all the options that you feel apply. That's 30 seconds, so in the poll. So as we tally the results, another question for Dr. Badiwala. So Matesh, RV dysfunction in the post-bypass period is common, particularly after a long pump run. During coronary re revascularization surgery, how do you differentiate transient post-pump dysfunction from true RCA ischemia, potentially warranting graft revision? You're right, this is... Uh... This is common, but the distinguishing feature for me is when I look at the heart, if it is transient post-pump dysfunction, when the heart's reperfusing, unloaded, the dysfunction typically gets better. So it's resolving. In this case, you are showing progressive dysfunction. And so that, that in combination with the fact that a coronary button was constructed would have um, uh, raised the concern that this was actually ischemia. The other thing I look at is the uh, evolution of the ECG. Uh, so it's it's the direction in which these evolutions occur. If the if the ECG changes are resolving, then I think it's post pump dysfunction that's resolving. If the function visually is improving, uh, then typically I, I chalk it up to post pump dysfunction. But if it is the other way around, where it's worsening with time, especially with the heart unloaded, then uh, you know after obviously excluding air or or um, uh, CO2 embolus, uh, then I'd be worried about true ischemia. Perfect. Thanks. So let's look at the poll results now. Okay, good. Another uh, uh, multiple uh, or kind of a split crowd, which is good. So 40% uh, expected management, uh, Doppler and epicardial ultrasound of the RCA, 40%. Back on bypass to examine the RCA button, 50%. And medical management with inotropes, 20, or in nitric, 27%, direct to cath lab from noir is 5%, okay. So we began by inspecting the RC button off pump with Doppler and epicardial ultrasound. Visual inspection confirmed that there was no obvious kink, but the surgeons released some overlying tissue that might have been exerting some compressive effects. A Doppler signal was present. Epicardial ultrasound showed turbulent RCA flow but an accurate Doppler interrogation for velocity could not be performed. Following this brief period of manipulation and evaluation, the RV function improved with minimal inotropic support. The patient tolerated protamine without issue and both valves continued to function well. The chest was closed without incident and the patient was brought to CVICU in stable condition. The patient was extubated shortly after surgery and progressed well in the immediate post-operative period. Unfortunately, around 12 hours after surgery, the patient became progressively hypotensive. Pressor requirements increased, urine output dropped, and the CVP rose precipitously. ECG showed marked ST elevations in V2 and V3. The surgeon was informed and suspecting a recurrent RCA issue, the patient bypassed the cath lab and emergently returned to the OR for exploration. TEE showed preserved LV and valve function, but moderate RV dysfunction. The RV was not excessively dilated, and there was no significant TR. Given the TEE findings, an RCA kink was diagnosed, and the surgeons proceeded with aorta coronary bypass of the RCA using an SVG graft. RV function was promptly restored with a good result. Unfortunately, follow-up transthoracic echo on post-operative day five continued to show moderately reduced RV function. Whether this represents myocardial stunning or permanent non-recoverable injury is too early to tell. 
The valves, however, both continued to work well. So uh, going through to our last case, case three. So case three represents a common problem that I'm sure we've all faced at our respective institutions. A 49-year-old man presented to hospital in acute pulmonary edema. In the weeks preceding this, he experienced increasing difficulties with leg edema, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, and orthopnea. ECG showed an anterolateral STEMI, an emergent cath showed high-grade left main and RCA disease. He was scheduled for urgent cabbage following a week of diuresis and afterload reduction. Baseline echo showed an enlarged LV with severely reduced function and associated ischemic MR. A basal septal aneurysm was identified, likely second to the recent infarct. Echocardiography also showed moderate RV dysfunction. Here are the transgastric views that show the true extent of the dilatation with an internal diameter of almost 70 millimeters. Inspection of the mitral valve was challenging as the large distended ventricle distorted the anatomy and dominated the imaging planes. In Carpentier 3B disease or secondary ischemic MR, mitral leaflets are anatomically normal but pulled apically in the LV as a result of outward displacement of the papillary muscles. This results in systolic restriction and incomplete mitral leaflet closure. This is what is described as a tethered valve. The degree of tethering is often asymmetric with the P3 scallop tethered more apically than P1. Now, if you evaluate the degree of MR using jet area alone, you will severely underestimate the degree of regurgitation. This is because the LA pressures are incredibly high here and the ability of the LV to contract and generate pressure is severely compromised. The vena contracta is a more reliable measure for grading the degree of MR in this case, which measure, measures seven millimeters. In addition, the 2020 ASC guidelines recommend using ERO of over 0.4 centimeters squared, a regurgitant volume of over 60 mils, and a regurgitant fraction of over 50% as criteria for severe MR. Accurately grading the severity of ischemic MR is vitally important, as the New England paper by Smith in 2014 showed that repair of moderate ischemic MR was associated with a reduced prevalence of regurgitation, but an increased risk of stroke at one year. Additional mitral valve measurements include a mitral valve annulus of 5.3 centimeters, a tenting height of 1.3 centimeters, a tenting area of 4.8 centimeters, an anterior mitral valve angle of 30 degrees and a posterior mitral valve angle of 54 degrees. So poll number five is what would you re recommend regarding mitral valve intervention? The characteristics of the valve are listed here to help with your decision. The options are do nothing as you expect the mitral regurgitation to improve with remodeling of the LV, B, mitral valve repair, repair or C, mitral valve replacement. This is a single choice poll. Thirty seconds, twenty-one answers. I'll end the poll. So, as we tally the results, another question for Dr. Bariwal. So, Matesh, what variables do you weigh most heavily when deciding to address the mitral valve in a patient with ischemic MR? So, as a general rule, we avoid leaving the OR after a cabbage with severe MR. So, if they show up to the OR and they actually truly have severe ischemic MR, then you ought to do something about it. The moderate, as you pointed out, is, is a gray zone. And in those patients, I would base my decision-making on their preoperative presentation. If they come in with congestive heart failure or symptoms of dyspnea consistent with their MR, then um, you ought to uh, you know, do something to, to at least repair the valve or reduce the, the MR. Um, 
In terms of, you know, our previous strategy of repairing severe MR, I think that's uh, by the trial, the CTS net trial has gone by the wayside. Um, the strongest predictor of failure is what you showed in this patient, which is the basal aneurysm. So patients with a basal dysfunction or basal aneurysm have, have a very high re re uh, recurrence rate of MR. And so the TEE does influence our decision based upon the presence or absence of a basal aneurysm. Um, if the valve is severely tethered, then a repair is unlikely to, to work. Um, and so those are our finer points that, that do help us. Um, in terms of does there seem to be a long-term outcome difference, I think there is in the symptomatic patient. There's no good data to suggest that there's any survival benefit, but in the patients that I've previously left moderate MR, for a variety of reasons, I've almost always regretted it because in their post-op follow-up, they often, if not always, have some degree of dyspnea and you wonder whether you could have made them just that much better by reducing their MR. Thanks. So let's look at the poll results now. Oh, split like uh, 33, 3. perfect, okay. So let's start with the decision of whether to intervene or not. The 2020 ACCHA guidelines for the management of patients with valvular heart disease outlines a treatment algorithm for patients with secondary MR. There is no proof that surgical correction of chronic secondary MR is effective in prolonging life, but observational studies and a sub-study of the randomized STITCH trial suggest that it is wise to address the mitral valve during cabbage when secondary MR is severe. As we have a patient with severe MR undergoing cabbage, surgical mitral valve correction in this case is a 2A recommendation. The issue of whether to repair or replace the valve affected by ischemic MR is much more challenging, and it's a question that has dominated the literature over the past 10 years. The debate centers around two main questions. One, are there any valve characteristics which can predict repair failure? And B, is there a longevity or quality of life benefit to repair versus replacement? Many studies have looked at echocardiographic predictors of recurrent ischemic MR following repair with varying results. Listed here are two papers which summarize these previous studies nicely and synthesize it into usable algorithms. The decision to repair or replace becomes much easier here when we realize that our patient exhibited almost every predictor of mitral repair failure described in the literature. These include a basal aneurysm, basal dyskinesia, an anterior leaflet angle of over 25 degrees, a posterior leaflet angle of over 45 degrees, a tenting height of over 11 millimeters, a tenting area of over 2.5 centimeters squared, and an LV and systolic volume of over 145 millimeters. But outside of this specific case, does the literature support mitral valve repair in the case of severe ischemic MR? The CTSN Working Group has aggressively pursued the answer to this question in a series of papers published in the New England Journal of Medicine. In 2014, Acker et al. observed no significant difference in left ventricular reverse remodeling or survival at 12 months between patients who underwent mitral valve repair and those who underwent mitral valve replacement. A long-term follow-up study by Goldstein in 2016 showed no significant between-group difference in left ventricular reverse remodeling or survival at two years. Mitral regurgitation occurred more frequently in the repair group, resulting in more heart failure related adverse events and cardiovascular admissions. These publications in general make the prospect of repair much less attractive. What is not clear is whether candidates for repair were selected with echocardiographic predictors of failure in mind. Perhaps there is a subset of the ischemic MR population that may benefit from repair. So applying the full breadth of CTSN criteria, we proceeded with ACB with mechanical mitral valve replacement owing to the patient's young age. The decision to replace the valve was further supported by the intraoperative finding of an infarcted medial papillary muscle, although there was no frank flail seen on the baseline echo. Three vessels were bypassed, including a sequential lima graft to the LAD and D1 and an SVG graft to the PIV. A 29 millimeter mechanical mitral valve was implanted the PFO was closed and the LAA excluded, given the high risk of both AF and appendage thrombus in the years to come, although the patient will have a lifelong anticoagulation requirement. 
So now it's time to evaluate the mechanical mitral valve. And continuous wave Doppler interrogation reveals the following double envelope trace. So our sixth poll is this. When interrogating the mitral valve, which is true regarding the double envelope phenomena? The options are A, this is a ghosting artifact. B, this is a reverberation artifact. C, this is a true hydraulic phenomenon. D, the largest envelope is the true envelope, or E, the densest envelope is the true envelope. And this is a multi-choice uh, poll question. You can select all the ones that you feel are, are true. That's 30 seconds, I'll end the poll again. Let's take a look at the results. So ghosting, reverberation, hydraulic phenomena kind of split, uh, and most, if not all, uh, look at the densest envelope as the true envelope, yeah. So the debate regarding the double envelope was recently hashed out by Weibel in 2019 in a letter to the editor in JCVA. Weibel's letter was in response to a publication by Couture et al, which referred to the double envelope as reverberation artifact, owing to the large amount of flow passing through the mitral valve at high cardiac outputs. A different group in an online communication to the American College of Cardiology suggests that the second Doppler envelope seen when interrogating the mitral valve inflow is a ghosting artifact. But if it were ghosting or rever reverberation due to high flow, why wouldn't it also affect other structures with even higher velocities, such as the aortic valve? Secondly, if you compare the envelope sizes, you will appreciate that the ratios between the envelopes are never consistent with reverberation or duplication artifact, which would require an exact doubling of the spectral envelopes. What they highlight, and something I had never appreciated in my own practice, is that the double envelope is only apparent when the continuous wave Doppler interrogation line is pointed towards the septum. Changing your angle to avoid the septum often will resolve the double envelope altogether. This supports the theory that the second envelope represents flow acceleration of the mitral inflow wall jet along the septum. Back to our case, inspection of the valve revealed a well-seated mechanical valve in the mitral position with characteristic washing jets. Continuous wave Doppler oriented towards the septum revealed a double envelope tracing. Tracing the densest jet revealed a peak gradient of eight and a mean gradient of three. These gradients did not increase with faster pacing or augmented SVR. Follow-up TTE on post-operative day seven showed significant recovery of LVE function following revascularization, with LVEF improving to 45%. Peak and mean gradients through the mitral valve were slightly higher at 18 over five, as expected. There was only trivial MR noted. Unfortunately, the RV function could not be assessed, but there were no clinical indicators of RV failure or dysfunction. And that brings us to the end of our presentation on TE and surgical decision making in the OR, as well as the end of our first year of multi center echo teaching series. Thank you all for your participation and attention. And I'll now hand it over to Rafael to field any additional questions. And Dr. Bariwala and Dr. Omran are both on the call to help uh, add additional insights.